I, I'd like to go on first by my facts with the Vancouver Sun. And I wanted to give you just a funny little perspective of how things started there. In 1955, I came as a copy runner. And before I knew it, I was uh, put into the dark room and uh, starting to do photography and wire photos and things. And I never lost my interest. And so close to 41 years, I was still there. And uh, in my career, I'm the only guy that I'm going to talk to you about today is I started with a 4x5 camera like this, right up to other cameras of 35 and 2 and a quarter, up to two years of digital photography. And it's quite a history with our West Van Vancouver Sun newspaper was here over this time from my era there we went from all of these different types of camera pre presentation to your pictures and every picture has a story every and the per person that knows most of the story about those photos is the person who took them but what i'm trying to get at is we started out with four by five and then in the uh, later uh, early late early late 50s we changed to two and a quarter film the papers were all leery about what the little negative called 35 mil so then we went on to the next year and the next year was we're going to go to 35 mil film but we're going to hire a photographer to do it for for a time and see how it works and he lasted three months and then bang they went to this to the 35 mil camera, which came out with all new features because they had a battle between Canon and Nikon. So the Sun has their, their time. They decided to go with the mode Nikon and uh, Canon went with the province and they were going back and forth. And then we got to the point, here we are with these cameras. There's a new camera coming out in digital. And we, they were really scared about digital. So in 1994, they bought six cameras from the wire people who took these cameras and made them, they were this big, to shoot pictures in digital. And they were 20,000 each. So the son took six of them and started us off shooting digital, which is what you've got today with your cell phones or your cameras. It's all digital. So there was the gone of film. No film at all. So the Vancouver Sun in the province announced in a story in 1994-95 they will no longer shoot film. Thus, a lot of things disappeared. We had labs that handled the film, excellent printers that would make the most beautiful prints you could ever want to see. But when digital come, goodbye prints. So they didn't exist you got a digital picture and that was it and that's it for the history of the Vancouver Sun. So that's all I wanted to tell you, just a little story that people don't know how these cameras floated through history and today they're right down to a cell phone where you've got a billion photographers. So it's, it's a long way to go and uh, I'd like to leave it at that about the Vancouver Sun. I'll let Mike talk to you. Okay, well I'm going to tell you a little more than what Laura told you, but, but she's completely correct. And I was at Argyle, and, and being a 15-year-old kid, I'd taken the two photography courses, and uh, I didn't know what else to do. So uh, I, I one day went to my photography teacher, who was a really cool black guy with an ascot, and uh, his name was Daryl Martin. And Daryl said, listen, I, I see you're interested in this photography thing, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invent courses for you to take on your own. I said, okay. So I spent the rest of my high school career in the dark room and shooting for Daryl Martin. Anyway, I, I graduated, got into Emily Carr, graduated from Emily Carr. And as Laura said, my, uh, I don't, my, my wife and my girlfriend both, uh, my wife and my girlfriend. <laughs> Actually, it's the same person. I, I married my girlfriend. But uh, my mom and my girlfriend both say that they saw this ad for a darkroom technician at the North Shore News. I got the job, and uh, as Laura said, I, I decided I was going to do it for a couple of weeks till I found something better. And uh, 34 years rolled by, and, and uh, Ralph and I on the drive over here 
tonight we're talking about how lucky we were never to really honestly work a day in our lives. Um, it, it was wonderful. And, and I have to tell you, um, Ralph and I have known each, uh, each other since about, uh, well, I, I started in 85. So I, I'll tell you what happened. In, in uh, uh, 85, I'd have my little camera with me and I'd think, oh, geez, the sun and the province are coming to the North Shore today. And we hated it because they'd roll into town, they'd have three cameras, they'd have all the gear, they'd have one assignment that day and they'd be paid three times what I was being paid. So the one bright spot of that whole thing was I'd always look for this big shock of curly hair, and it was Ralph Bauer. Because Ralph was unlike the rest of the photographers. The rest of them would walk up to the subject, say a few words, fire off the motor drive, get their photos, and run off. And they were very competitive. Ralph would walk over and I'd watch him. He'd sit down, he'd talk to them, he'd kind of caress them a little and say, listen, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to try that. We'll take a few. Uh, he, he was just different than the rest. Then he'd always walk by me and say, uh, okay, kid. He'd lean into me, give me the elbow. I got him warmed up for you. You go get a shot. I know you can do it. <laughs> and so here we are 35 years later. And uh, he taught me how to work with people and, and probably taught me how to be a better person. Um, seriously. Um, photography is, is 90, 98% talking to your subject and working with them, and 2% to the button clicking, as, as Ralph says. And uh, it, it really, really made a difference on me and, and how to work with people. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to be at the North Shore News. I've, I've, I just retired a few months back, and I'm, I'm doing a little contract work for them now. But uh, it's, it's time to move on and, and, and try something else. Um, there's, there's a great quote, and, and I, I always think of this. I only read it once, and I think it was Minor White. And Minor White was one of the great California photographers in the 70s. And I think it was him, although I've never found the quote again. And the quote is, there's never been a novel written that wasn't a picture book. And if you think about that, if you're reading a very good novel, it, 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 it paints, paints a beautiful picture of, of what it is, the imagery. And what Ralph and I have to do is the reverse of that. We have to take a photograph that maybe doesn't tell the whole story, but at least it's a portal into getting you in there and asking the questions of, of what's going on. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful career. And it, it's kind of sad because you're probably looking at the two last photographers, working photographers you're ever going to see. Um, you know, once the cell phone came along, we, we kind of saw the writing on the wall. And uh, it's, it's not that my publisher um, or, or Ralph's publisher wants to get rid of photographers, but it's just the nature of the beast's day. Uh, now that that you know that nobody wants to pay for anything and uh whether you're a photographer or a writer bloggers will do it for free and people will submit photos for free with their their iphones um and so so our careers are uh, kind of winding down but what a wonderful thing to do uh you know to work in the community that, that both of us grew up in and uh, the friendships and the people I've, I've met, I look across this room tonight and, and the people I see here that, uh, that I've, I've, well, put it this way, I have a running joke that I've been in every other house on the North Shore. And, um, and, and I've been in a lot of houses on the North Shore. Um, it's, it's been wonderful. So what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna show you a couple of photographs and, um, talk about them. Ralph's going to show you five and he's got a story for each. Okay, well um, every photographer wants to try and do something different so through a lot of maneuvering I finally got the Canucks to let me put a camera in the net for the first time and to do that camera you had to have infrared which helped 
at later history to make that camera work. Can, but it, can I just say something? It, just so you know, Ralph was the first person to put a camera in the net of a goal in the NHL. Now, to do this, I didn't have all the technology of the cameras you have today. I did not have inter infrared. I had to have a direct line to the camera to make it work when I wanted to shoot my pictures. So I hooked up a wire that went to the camera through the ice and it was a doorbell. <laughs> and at the other end, I'd push the button like you say hello on your doorbell and the camera would click. And that's how I got my pictures. But I thought, well, gee, I guess I got some good pictures. I'm okay, Something, the camera worked. Yeah. Because I did it three times and one time, a cameraman named Richard Berger was all planned and everything. He, at the last minute after the national anthem, flicked my camera out of the net, thinking that it was bad luck. <laughs> and he had seven goals scored on him. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> but, but the thing with the picture was, I didn't realize, when I got in the dark room and, and looked at the naked, I said, the goalie looks kind of offbeat. What's that about? And I printed it. And he had all this snow on his mask, mm -hmm. made the picture. Yeah. That, that picture was made because of that snow on his mask. Mm -hmm. And of course, when a player comes in, they fire uh, snow at you with their skates, and he caught it right after the goal. So it made the picture, and the paper ran at two pages, uh, two pictures on the whole page. And it was kind of nice to have that little record. So that's my hockey days. I, I used my model, a chair. I put a chair in the goal and then focused my camera with the chair and then when I brought it the next day it was in focus. It's the only way you could do it. You didn't have infrared where you could just change the focus. So it was a pioneer effort but it worked. Anyways, that's it. Now, this is a real story. This is one of the pictures I'm proud of and I think it's the best Thing, feeling to me I ever had because I grew up with Harry Jerome and I didn't know he was going to make the world's record this day and I didn't know he was going to be the fastest man in the world but I he knew and I, he knew I was covering for the sun and I wanted to make sure I got a good picture of him because he's my friend and it turned out I got him coming to the wire and he broke the world record the fastest man in the world I couldn't ask for a better situation. But the story of Harry Jerome and I, we even went to the Vancouver Forum to try out for a hockey team together. And we'd been on the ice maybe once every two months, and the players on the uh, get applying were on it two, three times a week. So you know how long we lasted. But we laughed about it. But then a funny thing happened on the way to the Forum. <laughs> the city of North Van, you wouldn't believe this, they gave medals, civic medals, to three people. And the third per person I wasn't too happy about was Scholes driving, Mr. Scholes, because he shot, taught 50% or more of people in North Vancouver how to drive. And he got third, and of course Harry Drome got first, and I got the silver. I couldn't have been more proud in my whole life, more so my mother. It was a real tribute for a picture, and that I'll never forget it. Uh, uh, now, just, I'll be quick on this one. My sports editor says he's coming in for the big fight, the title fight. Ellie, and he says, I want a good picture of Ellie. He's coming in at the airport, and we don't want a headshot now. You're paid. Think something. And I said, well, how am I going to do him at the air? There's nobody knows he's coming. And the, what am I going to do? And all the way there, I've got to be honest, I worried. So when I got there and he got in there, there was only three reporters, Archie McDonald and two others, interviewing him. So as soon as they were finished, I tried to be honest with him. And I said, look, Ali, I've got a picture page open on our sport page. And I need a good picture of him. I thought maybe he's going to give me a funny face or something. He picked up the axe off the wall, didn't say boo, and said, I'm going to cut trees in the park to get in shape. <laughs> I didn't make that picture. He, he did. That, you never know that, but that's what happened. And 
that's the way it goes. Yeah, but really, you talked him into that. You know, you got to cajole a bit, and, and you, you worked your magic on him, I'm sure. Now, uh, there's someone behind this picture. There's always someone behind it. I'm coming to work, starting my shift about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, and the guy in charge is partly in charge, a, a spot news photographer, Danny Scott. He calls me on the radio and he says, Ralph, I think there's a, an interesting news shot here. A guy's got his distraught daughter. Get over to Cordova Street. So right away I got there and I had a big long lens that I just got that I was proud of and I was sneaking up to see this man at the window and you see the knife he has in his hand? Well, I got about halfway up and just over the ledge was a Great Dane dog and I was worried he might just reach over and bite my ear off. He wasn't happy. And I was looking at this guy and he just had the the uh, knife at the youngster's throat and he yelled down to the police get that camera out of here or else I'm gonna cut her throat well they came down marching the police and I knew it was time to get the heck out of there and I started going back, back behind the lines and a guy yells Ralph and I said who is it and here it is my ex photographer who was working for Global P TV with his van parked there and he flipped the door open and I jumped in <laughs> and then I sat in there for about five minutes I got the camera with the window down that's what he was doing gonna drop the child so I took the picture and uh, it went on forever I took it to the sun and the darkroom man grabbed it, wouldn't even let me have the film and he closed the door and I was all worried I said this guy might put it through that fast development. I don't want, oh no, he'll do it right. And he'd come out and he wouldn't let me have the, have the film. And he put it and dried and went and printed it. And it was the right picture at the right time. But there was someone else behind it. And I, I sort of felt sorry about this, being that the man was a distraught father and they had a breakup and he wasn't happy on getting control of the, of the boy. And he made a ransom of a case of beer and what happened was they charged him at the door and got him and the youngster was never dropped and in the meantime they put down support to catch him which would have made it better but the the picture was just a picture on the way to work by a good guy that got me going at it and it's the best award-winning picture I've ever had in my whole life I got the national I got five awards for it all the month the, the year the week and that, it's sad to say, but that's the reason I got my Civic Award medal, because of that picture only. But it, it just uh, something you don't get these days, and it was a sad story, but a good ending. But you told me if he would have dropped the child, you wouldn't have shown the picture to us. No, yeah. that's right. I wouldn't have. I'd have said I didn't get it. Yeah. Now, this, this, I'll be brief on this. This is Second Arrows Bridge, and as I said, I was over there first. And when I got there, I was seeing all these boats moving around. And while I'm waiting there, there's no people who are no dead people, but they're ready to go in with those boats and pick up the people that were didn't make it. Some of the 18. And I, I knew in our game, you don't shoot dead people. We never run them. It was just a no-no. So I'm just ready and I shoot this picture and my boss came beside me and said, look, give me, give me half of your film, I'm short, and go up to the hospital. So he got rid of me because he wanted to do the, the show properly. He, I was just a young guy, you know, on staff. So I bolted up to the hospital and left everything at this scene. And it turned out that I got two hot pictures at the hospital and I snapped one of the survivors coming out alive and they made a page of paid pictures. And the situation, it goes on a little further. Three weeks before this, I w was allowed to go right out on those two spans and shoot a page of pictures of all these guys working. And then three to four weeks later, it's down. So it was a long story to me. A very, and it's very North Van. It's a very sad story. But things happened and it happened and I think we played it the right way. And, and you should tell everybody you were using the speed graphic to shoot it. He wasn't using a big digital, he was using this camera that holds 
two images, two, two negatives. This, this one holds 10, but I didn't have that image one. I had one that, that, that actually on it uh, held 12, but it was a paper type thing. And, and my boss, boss took your it. Your boss came along and took all your film, didn't you? Yeah, it left me enough to go to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's just story, but it, as I say, it become a lot more of a uh, history than I thought it would for North Vancouver. Well, there, there's another great quote. Um, that I like to think I came up with, and because uh, I can't find anybody that else did, but I, I quite often, if I'm giving a talk, will say it's hard to see history when you're living it. And if you look around the room at all these photographs that Ralph's taken, when he was taking them, he had no idea the the importance or um, you know what they were going to mean 20 or 30 years later. And uh, it's like if tonight, if we took a picture of the crowd put it in a drawer for a year and pulled it out, you'd say, oh, there's the crowd. But if we put it away for 30 years and pulled it out, we'd look at the cameras here, we'd look at what everybody was wearing, we'd look at the architecture, the technology, and it, it, it's a completely different game. So the, the documentary value of these photos is just incredible. It, it really is. Well, Mike is sort of the young generation. When I, I packed it up in 96, and he was going full barrel for North North Van, <clears throat> and he was shooting, every photographer I work with had different uh, characteristics. We had one fellow, Denny Eaglin, perfect portrait photographer, so we called him Karsh. Mm -hmm. And we had Bill Cunningham, who was a f famous Provost photographer, and the Canucks all named him Rembrandt. So we had names, and uh, the, in my era when I was young, coming along, they called me a button pusher and that is a little bit of an insult you know because you push a button and you, they say you're not creative well that goes on with history but Mike is a different generation and he comes up with the artistic type of picture and as you'll see these pictures here of Mike's they are not recordings they are p pictures that he has illustrated and performed as a presentation. They're not just a photograph grabbed because Joe said this. They're done with artistic moves. And I was never known to be able to do that. So you have every different photographer. Now Mike excels on this. I can tell you by his pictures. Thank you. One more. Okay, so um, Ralph and I were trying to decide what we were going to show. We had, to, we had to, to get it down to five photographs each. So I decided I wasn't going to bring my, the best photographs. I was going to bring the most interesting ones, or ones that I thought were a little bit different. So as Ralph said, every photographer is different. And when we get a job and they send us out there, you're driving over in your car and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. She's going to look like that. The place is going to look like this. And it's never what you thought it was going to be. So you, 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 know, you, can, you can run through all these scenarios of what you're going to shoot, but when you get there, it's completely different. So this one is at Ambleside. Every time it gets windy at Ambleside, the, the kite surfers come out. And the problem with shooting kite surfing is the kites are maybe 60, 80 feet above the surfer. So it's really hard to get a decent shot of these guys unless you go in really tight. And as I was walking down there towards, uh, towards the beach, I just saw the sun coming from the Lionsgate Bridge that to, to the east, coming across the water in this silvery sort of light and the tide was coming in and this guy was just about to launch his board and uh, managed to get this shot just before I fell down the rocks and broke my camera, I tumbled down. And, but I got the shot anyway, so it's okay. Um, you know, I, I, another quote I read the other day was, um, when you photograph people in color, you photograph their clothing. And when you photograph them in black and white, you photograph their soul. And all of uh, Ralph's photos here are in black and white. And, and I didn't purposely bring black and white photos, but I really love black and white because it strips away a lot of layers and really gets down to the, the, the crux of uh, composition and, and tonal range and that sort of thing. So this one here, I, I shot this years ago at Carson Graham, and the reason I brought this was this 
video class had won an award. And this is typical. I show up and in my mind's eye I'm thinking, okay, I'll shoot them with the video camera and I'll, I'll add this and I'll try that. Well, I got there and they're typical teenagers. They weren't really interested. They didn't have the awards. They didn't have a camera. They didn't have anything. So I sent one of them home to get his award. I sent another one to get the custodian to open the cabinet to get a video camera. And it took about an hour and a half of us goofing around to get this. So I ended up standing them over here and filming them within the, the, uh, the camera itself. Um, once again, it probably means more to me than anybody, just because I know what a pain in the butt it was to, to get it done. Okay, so whenever, whenever there's weather on the North Shore, I, I always know I'm gonna be the guy that has to go out and get it. So on my way in, it's a foggy day. You're always trying to find something, and fog is elusive. When, by the time you get there, it's gone. Um, whatever you saw poking out of the sun, or pardon me, the fog is, is gone. Um, and the Lionsgate Bridge is, is a good one. If you can find the right spot, and I was up on Sentinel Hill, I think it is, and I was just waiting and waiting and waiting, and all of a sudden the, the fog sort of curled around and let go just enough of the bridge. And, and being as iconic as it is, us Vancouverites know exactly what that is the moment you see it. So as Ralph and I will attest, you know, sometimes it's skill and, and sometimes it's just dumb luck. So. Now, this one was a funny story in that the, uh, the Vancouver Aquarium releases seal pups after they've raised them. And uh, we had a girl, Dina Lancaster, that worked for us for years, and, and she left, and she took a PR job at the Vancouver Aquarium. And she texted us one day and said, I'm not saying we're doing this, but we're letting seals go at Kate's Park in about an hour if you want to show up. Well, unfortunately, somebody told a mother that was in a Facebook group and within 20 minutes, there were about 150 kids and people. And if you look, they've all got cell phones and cameras, and they're all and the poor little seals. They let them out of the boxes, and they they just looked around. So I got out on this little precipice of of, of rock and and crouched down in a ball and shot everybody shooting the seal or, or taking photos. And the, the the nicest part of it was all the seals came to me right right at my feet and started swirling around. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the power of social media once again. Uh, that was not too long ago, maybe three, four years ago. Yeah, they, they do it every once in a while. Um, now this photograph is, is in, in my opinion, uh, the best photograph I've ever taken. It's my favorite photograph, and it's probably the one I had the least to do with. So um, the only credit I could take possibly is, is a little bit of intuition. Um, and it's a lovely story because um, uh, I was at the office and they said, oh, we want this old vet's getting a, uh, an award. The um, uh, French uh, consulate's um, giving him the highest, the Legion of Honor, I think it was, he was receiving. And I thought, oh, great, another grip and grin where the old guy's on stage, gets a handshake. And, you know, so I really wasn't expecting anything. So I got to Cedarview, Cedarview Lodge where he lives. And his name was Jim Burton. And it was also his 101st birthday. And he was a little tiny guy. He was about four feet tall. And uh, I said to him, listen, Jim, can I get an insurance shot before you go up on stage? And he said, yeah, but I'd love to get my wife Susan in the picture with me. I said, sure. He said, she's got dementia, so we have to go to the other end of the, uh, the hospital. So he shuffled along, and I followed him down there, and we got to the other end, and, and Susan was lovely. She, was, she, she knew who he was, and she was all smiles. And, and he took her by the hand. And I found this little area where, where the light was coming in, and it was sort of subdued. It was up against a little courtyard. And I put a little plastic chair down. And he said, I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. I'm just going to get her ready. So I stood back, and I just watched him. And, and the love between these two is just amazing. They've been married for 70 years. And he, he combed her hair and put barrettes in it. And just when he was finished, she grabbed his hands. And he kissed her head, and I'd already taken the picture, and he said, we're ready, Mike. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I took a few more, but uh, I, I literally I just stood back and watched it unfold. And, and, and in our job, that once in a while that happens, not very often. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that I'll ever take a picture that I like more than this one. Yeah. Well, it, it, does, it, it does tell a natural story. 
And you could look at it for a long time and keep looking at it because it's not just a photograph, it's got a lot of feeling to it. And uh, it's the first time I've ever seen it and I could look at it for quite a while and, and enjoy the thoughts of what it is. And you don't, that, that is that talent that people have, they're all different photographers and Mike has that talent beyond his other talent, he's had loads of pictures in the North Shore News, you know, the, the different angles and the way he shoots. He, he doesn't go and take a straight shot of somebody looking at the camera. He knows what he's doing and he's done a very good job for the North Shore News, I'll tell you that. Thank you, Ralph. It's, it, it, believe it or not, it, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful job, but it's also a, a highly frustrating job because you're, you're quite often trying to convince people that you know best. And there's a lot of people that have already made up their mind that they want their picture taken a certain way. And I, I tell people that hate having their picture taken, just give up. I'm going to take your picture, just give up. And, and the beauty of digital now is I can take a couple, show it to them, and they say, hey, that's not bad. And then they're putty in your hands. So. <laughs> I've done a lot of work in the shipyards, and, and Ralph and I, we were talking, Ralph's got this great system of, of boards, the photo boards, and, and I, I'm not smart enough to do that, so I only brought three photos with me, but um, and it's not so much a plug for myself, but if, if you want to see more of my photos, you can, you can look. I do have a website, and, and there's a ton of photos on there, and I love nothing more than getting up at five in the morning and, and heading out and going to a river or going to the shipyards or something and just kind of creeping around until the sun comes up. And, and uh, I did a whole series, and, and I think the photo's behind this column over here at the back, but it's on keel blocks. And I did this whole series, and the keel blocks traditionally were made of giant chunks of uh, timbers, and they build the, the, the uh, keels of the boat, or the hulls of the boat on top of these keel blocks, and they were stapled together with, with great big staples. And they eventually started, as timber became too expensive, they started making them out of concrete. And um, they'd have a heavy timber on top and, and they'd bring them into the dry dock and they're about six or eight feet long, maybe six feet tall. And they'd put maybe 50 or 100 of them there, bring the vessel in that was being repaired and then drain it. And it would sit on top of these. Well, over the years, they'd, they'd crack and check and the guys, gals would write things on them, numbers and signatures. and beautiful paints and patinas and, and welding sparks and everything else. Everyone's got its own story. And I spent uh, lots of time shooting those. Um, it was wonderful. And, and you know, it, it's one of these things that I realize now, which I, I, I wish I'd realized when I was younger, that, that by, you know, looking at Ralph's photos here, you, you see that, as I say, it's hard to see history when you're living it. It really is because you don't see that when the St. Alice Hotel is being knocked down, that the importance of that to, to this community. Um, I took a group of students into the um, into C-SPAN shipyards. It was the first group of, of people, uh, non-politicians or, or non-workers that they'd allow to go in. And we walked in and we got read the riot act. We had to wear steel toe boots and safety helmets and high-vis vests and goggles. And they told us, you know, they're sandblasting down there today. You guys have to stay in this row and you can't go. And they, they gave us these two old guys, Tony and Al, in their coveralls. And Tony and Al said, oh, come on, follow me, we'll go down there. So we went underneath giant tugboats and they were sandblasting and there was sparks flying everywhere. And these kids got to go through. They were 15, 16 years old. And it was just, just a shooting gallery. It was just amazing. Um, but I said to them before we went in, you're not going to understand this, but, but what you're about to do isn't going to be here in, uh, in 30 years. And, and so really kind of drink this in because you're, you're probably the last bunch of kids that are ever going to be able to come through here and, and take these photographs. And I wish I'd realized that younger. I would have taken a lot of photographs differently than, uh, than I did at the beginning of my career. But that's life, right? You figure things out towards the end when, when you're old and worn out. But. <laughs> So I think at this point, um, we're going to answer a few questions if, uh, if anybody's got any. Once again, I was ordered to take a young lady that our editor, a very attractive young lady that he'd met up in uh, 
Cologne at one of the regattas or something. And he just said, I've got this girl, and she's crazy for Elvis. And we got a press conference down at the Bay Shore. And he's just going to talk or something. He's not going to do anything. But she, take her and let her meet him or see him. She said it'd be a million dollars for my, and I, he wasn't trying to be a fast guy moving with her. He, he was genuine about for her sake. So I took her, and of course, it turned out Elvis couldn't make the press conference. There was somebody, maybe he had a cold like I do or something. But anyways, he did not make it there. And she sat in the corner, and I didn't know anything about all this. She looked like she was crying, you know. I'm so sad I didn't see Elvis. And this fella come over to her and said, what's the matter? And being a pretty girl. and. Uh, she said, oh, I got my chance to see Elvis, and I never saw him. So he says, well, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So I said, well, I got to go. And she said, oh, I'll stay here. I want to talk to that man. Well, two days later, she said, Elvis is in, uh, in, uh, on his concert, and uh, I can get you to get me a picture with him. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> she says, no, he's his bouncer. <laughs> He's in charge of them, and what he says goes. And I said, don't, you're giving me the gear. She said, I'm not. So I said, okay, I'll meet you at the door. I stood out the dressing room door. Nobody saw Elvis, nobody. He opened the door, and to her, he went. <laughs> I went in with my speed graphic, mm -hmm. and Elvis walked up to me, and he looked like a very shy man, i got to admit it. And he said to me, uh, Glad to meet you, sir. And I don't know why I said to him, I said, don't call me sir, I'm only a year older than you. <laughs> well, well, he thought that was funny and it cooled him down. And he sat with the girl, I got two shots with this camera, and then the guy said, out. <laughs> but uh, nobody got a personal interview with Elvis. And it wasn't because of me, I wouldn't have never got in there. So that's how things worked out in those days. I hate to boast all the time. <laughs> But the famous quarterback, and I guess nobody in here knows of him, Jackie Parker. Yes. Well, he came to the Lions at the end of his career, and he was executive with the Lions and things. And one day I happened to, this is a funny story, and I, I'm the only guy that can know about it. I was in the press box and sitting down with my binoculars, and the guy in charge came and said, hey, you can't sit in here, you're a photographer, out, out of here, come on. And Jackie Parker walked by and he says, is there a problem here? And uh, the guy says, yeah, well, I'm just telling him just the press reporters are in here. And Jack says, this guy can go wherever he wants. He's usually out in the mud and the rain when we're playing. So, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. So I sat there and everything was fine. And then I saw Jackie coming back. And this is the most, f I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And he said to me, I said to him, I approached him, I said, thank you very much for sticking up for me. He said, oh, that's no problem. He says, if I wanted to come back in this world again, I'd like to be a photographer <laughs> like you. <laughs> I, I think he wanted money, but, but uh, it floored me. Because my hero said something like that. Huh? Maybe he was just knew I liked him that much. I don't know. Funny little things. I do. And the whistle was, you'd hear, we monitored police calls all the time. We had lo the same uh, speakers they had in the police cars, so we knew everything the policemen were doing. And all of a sudden, you'd hear a ring, bank alarm. Well, we got to go on a bank alarm. So they'd say, get going. And we'd go down in the elevator and start across Granville, uh, uh, be in front of the, uh, front of the, uh, the paper. And the guy would go to the window and blow the window, blow the whistle, because it was a false alarm, <laughs> and you come back. Because they did not want you wasting your time running off to something that wasn't a real holdup. So one day, one, uh, one guy said something to the, go to the window and do, do the whistle. And he thought he said, go to the window and throw the whistle. <laughs> so that happened, and that was a funny story. But. In those early days of the sun, uh, there were stories you could go on for hours, hours of real friendship of journalism. I, I can't really explain it, but we had so many people. Uh, move, some were pretty well movie stars, the way they acted. And <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, we had great people in the history of 
both papers. And uh, good, good reporters, Jack Webster, people like that. And I just, I, I find a lot of photos of my home in my basement only because I was a squirrel. <laughs> and guys would say, where are you going with that picture? I'd say, well, they're going to throw it out. And I have the marks where they were going to, they cropped it in the paper. And I never thought nothing of it. I just piled them up, put them in a little, <laughs> little envelope. And just, I started looking around the other day. And I just looked at 30 envelopes. And every one of them's got a beautiful picture. Lady Di or Queen or people I could go on and on about with a package of clippings from the sun. I never remember putting them in all these envelopes. And with the prints, they're valuable. But I don't know. Maybe it's beyond people ever wanting to see them. But I have them, and only because I was a squirrel. They called me a squirrel because I took them home. He's a button-pushing squirrel. Yeah. That, that's about it. What's ended up happening is, um, you know, our friend, well, our friend, the fellow down south that tells us all about fake news, um, the people I work with at the North Shore News, like Ralph says, these are credible people that have been to journalism school that will not print anything unless they have it triple checked. You know, I, I sit by them, I used to listen to them and phone and phone again and they'd have a breaking story and if they couldn't confirm it, they wouldn't run it. They'd have to wait. But now bloggers, meaning anyone, can put out a story and they don't have to take any responsibility if the story's incorrect. If we were to do that, we'd be shut down in a heartbeat. So it, it's really sad because nobody, and it's not the fault of the newspapers, but nobody wants to pay for journalism. And the really sad part of it is the countries that don't have journalists, proper journalists, are run their dictatorships. So the government is going to tell you what they want you to know. And if we want to live that way, well, then let's get rid of the journalists. But, you know, a friend of mine, she jokingly said to me years ago, oh, Mike, it's only the North Shore News. <laughs> well, I can tell you, it's only the North Shore News. But if you live on the North Shore and you didn't read the North Shore News, you wouldn't know what the hell was going on here. Yeah. I think one of the problems, as you say, there's so many photos out there now that, that, that people don't take time to look at them the same way we used to, where you, you, you'd read something and look at it. Now they're doing this. They're, you've got the cell phone and they're just flipping past it. You know, man bites dog, dog bites man. I, I read something the other day and it said something like, it was like 80% of the stories online, people don't read them before they pass them on. They read the headline Oh, that's interesting. And they send it off, but they don't read the story. So, you know, I think if, if you've got a photo that captures your attention for more than 10 seconds, you've, you've done it. Because most people nowadays, they look for two or three seconds. They just, so really it doesn't matter what fills the hole. And, and I, I hate to say it, but um, shouldn't hate to say it, people with gray hair tend to Spend a little more time looking at things. <laughs> so true. As I say, Ralph and I, were, were, we like to chat. And, and I'll, I'll admit to you that I've actually gone to someone's house and had such a wonderful conversation with them. I got out to my car after and I thought, I forgot to take their picture. <laughs> and I had to go back and knock on the door. And that, that has happened to me before. So we're, just to leave it on a high note, um, we, we just want to thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, and, and we're so happy. I can't believe I'm as old as I am. I, he, he was my mentor when I was a kid. And I had a kid a couple of years ago come up to me and start talking about dark rooms and, and film. And, and I looked at him and he's like, holy smokes, he's looking at me like I look at Ralph. <laughs> yeah, oh well, I guess so. But uh, we've, we've had a wonderful, wonderful career. Um, we met a lot of good people, yes, haven't we? Yes, a lot of good people. And um, that's what it's all about. Great. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. I didn't have my wife for 60-some odd years. Yay. I'd be in big trouble. <laughs>